Thanks, Nigel. Um, so my talk's a little bit different. Um, so at the moment, I'm not running any labs, but what I've been doing since um, the early stages of COVID is keeping a strong eye on what's going on across the whole sector, both the UK and the USA, with regard to lab provision. I try to kind of capture the essence of the approaches that have been adopted in the short term and suggestions of what may need to happen in the future. Um, so that's what I'm trying to summarise here. So I'm not talking about specific techniques or approaches, just the kind of generic kind of levels. Um, so I'll go to my next slide. So where I've got this information from is really three places. So where the, where the sector is at the moment is really three places. So I'll give some details in a minute. So the three main approaches in the short term were around videos, animations, some kind of simulation of data results, uh, and then some sort of interactive feature. So um, I've taken this information from Pandemic Pedagogy, which is a big American uh, group of educators um, from, from Twitter, from looking at universities' published responses COVID and from some of the male kind of chat groups I'm on. So that's where I've drawn this information from. So um, videos and animation seems to be a very common response in the short term to coping with practical insecurities. I'm just going to give you a, a list of some of the kind of examples of things that I've seen and I appreciate they do overlap um, with each other dramatically. So standard kind of machine or technique use video or operation video or um, uh, uh, principles of machine video, um, practice videos, so showing that technique used uh, incorrectly or incorrectly, um, introduction to practical classes explaining the context and learning outcomes, obviously done in a video form, um, some form of experimental run through and the examples I've seen were very varied, um, some were kind of all live videos of the whole practical experience, which are either done um, third person as, uh, with an audio commentary or through the eye of the experimenter, so peek the camera. Some had more uh, cutaways to represent those periods of the practical when uh, nothing was happening. Um, um, so, um, some people had things like time lapse videos, um, health and safety videos, and pointing out hazards. So two things which are a little less obvious, things I may not have thought about myself before uh, COVID, where what happens next videos, so where uh, an aspect of the practical was shown and then the video stopped and then the student had to select what would happen next, what reagent to put in, you know, what to make a decision before the video played uh, based on that. So some of the considerations even perhaps making the practical itself. Um, they were the very generic ones. There's lots of specialist ones based on the disciplines within life sciences. Um, I just like one which may not be relevant to anybody here, but just goes to show the kind of short term innovation is um, uh, garden ecology, um, which is some uh, academics in those areas have been using the resources near them um, to teach ecology, encouraging their uh, students to do the same. So that's videos and animations. Of course, there's a problem with those, which we'll come to in my next slide, is if you don't have the videos or animations, then what do you do? Um, second thing is kind of simulation of uh, data stroke results. But this was an incredibly common short-term response. Um, and data sets were presented to students in all sorts of formats. And uh, I'm sure you're clogging up all of our external hard drives, there are some data sets going back many years from practical classes and our own research efforts. Uh, the ones I liked most of these, and this aligns to uh, uh, David's talk and Dave Lewis's work, is those data sets which were part of an active um, research project in some form. Um, um, some people you still did group practical discussions, so basically took the data sets but still made the students work in groups come together to form a common problem. A few people kind of use the kind of flip lab approach. So designing a uh, lab, come up with a hypothesis, designing a methodology, and then perhaps simulating data. 
so they can test that hypothesis with the idea that eventually they might be able to go back to the labs and actually run it themselves, basically flipping the experience. Uh, and several people, as we've seen in the example so far, use things like simulations and those kind of approaches to simulate data in real time. I mean, looking across the sector, there's a big difference whether the lab was effectively a dry lab beforehand or was a wet lab beforehand on the quality of those animations and those things that existed beforehand. Um, uh, so, uh, that's the simulation of data results. And then the third kind of approach is a kind of more interactive thing. Um, so, looking across the sector, these were less common and they tend to be when people had either an in house team that had pre made something or those of us that um, use companies um, um, like Labster or whatever um, as part of their undergraduate provision already. Um, so, that was the, the kind of the third approach used. And perhaps you have others, and if you do, it'll be great to see those in the chat. But that's what the sector did in the short term. And for many of us, the, the lockdown came when there were between three and six weeks left of the standard undergraduate two semester term. So they in a way got us by for um, that period. So now is what we're going to do going forward. Um, so I've just framed these slides and they're mostly questioned really uh, in two forms. Uh, and the first one is, what happens if remote is the only option? So there's no chance of any students whatsoever going back to the lab. What's the answer? So if you're expecting me and Nigel to turn up on a magic broom and uh, give you the answer to your lab problems, um, that's not going to happen because there isn't one. Um, um, and certainly not in the long term, but re recreating that practical experience. But I mean, our view is that the answer is more of what we've just seen on the previous slide videos animation simulations and interactive features side or with some sort of reshaping of our delivery structure now, and when i say that i know several universities now are looking at how their program stroke modules stroke sessions are spread over the academic year and with the hope, anticipation that labs may open up in more capacity post uh, December 2020, whether we can restructure things so labs are in that second half and more of the theoretical concepts come forward. Um, so that's the um, kind of general ap approach. There's, there's got obviously a kind of a big but on that. And this is where um, mine and Nigel's idea comes from. So looking back on my own practicals that I run, I do have a couple of videos and a couple of animations which I've produced myself. I don't have many. And they certainly don't cover the full breadth of things I like my students to see. And I'm sure nearly all of us are in exactly the same situation where we produce lab introductions or technique demonstrations to help our on-campus students understand techniques and approaches. Um, and it, it's our view that the only way forward is we come up with some sort of repository to share those resources in an open, spirit, open, friendly, spirited way so we can all benefit from our shared um, expertise. So what we've done is we've created uh, a very first draft of what this repository may look like. Um, it's created on OneNote um, and we'll share the link with you uh, afterwards or, or, or in the chat pot. This is just a screenshot of, of, of it here. At the moment, it's incredibly, incredibly basic and simple. So we haven't uploaded many examples on there yet, just a few, just to show you what we are, what we are thinking. So this is just the introduction page. Um, and when you go on it, you'll be able to go on to a, a, a tab which says general resources. And then there's two sub pages off there. One is for sites stroke repositories. And you can see from the very small screenshot in there, there's the name, a little description about what it is, and the link. Uh, and then for me, the really important thing is the box at the end, which is asking for reviewers' comments. I've seen other repositories out there, there are several, and they're a long list of links, but we really need people who know something about the uh, specific disciplines within there to critique those, to save us the time and uh, help find out what's useful and not in a context. 
and then there's another link below for individual videos and calls. So there's lots of mass uh, uh, video sharing sites out there which do have science techniques on on them, and finding those which we have produced and know they are at the right academic level would be really useful for constructing labs. We've also got a um, uh, tab called special interest groups. There's nothing in it yet, and that's really up for discussion. Uh, do we do we want to um, make some focus groups uh, dealing with um, anatomy and physiology, with animal models, etc. In their special, I did one in for capstone projects, and David Smith earlier on mentioned David Lewis's work um, on capstone projects, and with his permission, I'll put his uh, the when I mentioned the cat box in there along with David's contact details as a starter. So that's the idea that we um, have this shared repository, and if I mean, there's 122 people uh, who logged on at the start. You know, if we all put three or four videos links on there, I mean, that's a massive resource which will help enormously, at least in the early, short to medium term with our laboratory planning. I guess the other thing to start thinking about is if some lab access is possible, even as early as September, and how we're going to do that. What are the key questions that we need to address? Um, and can we answer them collectively for the benefit of all our students? Um, so I saw in the chat box administrators came up, um, and I think that's a really important one. Most undergraduate laboratories, which are normally quite large, rely heavily on demonstrators to support. Demonstrators need to go close. I was scratching my head on how you could show someone how to calibrate a microscope with from two meters away uh, as a very simple example. I think there's some more bigger questions. I mean, travel is very restricted at the moment. Can we um, use each other's laboratories if laboratories are open? Um, to allow our students to access equipment or kit. I have seen that happen just at the start of the um, crisis where some universities kindly let students ecology-based equipment, uh, even though they weren't their own students, but just, it happened to be near their home. So it's just really just an open call for some of those questions. Um, and I'm conscious of time, so I think I'll stop there, Nigel, and uh, see if anyone's got any questions, or if not, allow someone else to speak.